My name is Javier Llamas. I am an adjunct professor of history at Baxter College, and I will be discussing World War I from the United States military perspective, namely the uh, previous uh, decade policies, naval policies, that left the United States uh, unprepared for any engagements in World War I. My angle is to show that these policies of the previous decade have a direct effect on the American military and its readiness to engage in any war. This also led to a national change in policies in regards to the draft that had an effect on all, all social aspects, including citizenship and race relations. On April 6, 1917, the United States formally declares war on Germany. This is a change in policy considering that just six months prior, Woodrow Wilson was elected under the guise of he kept us out of war. But now on April 6, 1917, war is declared and this is a change in the, this progressive era because most of the people that elected him wanted this policy of isolation and a policy of neutrality because they were more worried about the issues at home, not so much worried about the situations abroad. With the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, thus plunging a lot of these European nations into war through this entangled alliances, there were many camps that were against joining the war effort. One, of course, were the immigrants. There was a lot of immigration into the United States, Ellis Island, Angel Island in the West Coast, north from Mexico because of the Mexican Revolution, or even some from Canada coming down. But a lot of these immigrants from the East Coast were descendants of Germans, some Irish, and thus many of them did not agree whether a, a war against Germany or even helping England at all because of some of these groups, these old world rivalries. Another ones were these progressives, as I mentioned, that did not want to be part of anything that would help out the rest of the world, considering that there was a lot of issues going on in the nation, whether it was prostitution, alcoholism, prohibition, stuff like that. And another camp were military people that were interested in participating, but didn't know how. Uh, whether it would be just engaging Germany through a sort of naval uh, warfare, because that's what Germans were engaging the Americans through their uh, submarine warfare, or would it actually involve boots on the ground? These are some of the camps that were trying to jostle for policy influence, and thus engaging in the war at that moment was not feasible, and thus there was no war by the United States. One of the situations that happened here is that on the day of the declaration, the United States only had about 125,000 army regulars and about 180,000 uh, National Guardsmen. That was it. So any engagement would require more soldiers. So they knew that this is not a thing that they could do at this time. But how did the U.S. get to this position? A lot of people believed that back then that, that France needed help, and that was something they could all get behind, regardless of Germany, regardless of Britain. But how they're going to do it is the issue. Even though the United States had now entered the war and declared a uh, war against Germany, they were still heavily under strength. But how, one of the questions is how the United States get that way. Why were they so under strength when it came to the average foot soldier? Many of their rivals in Europe had standing armies of a million men, a million plus men. Uh, even England, that carried similar policies to the United States because they were more focused on their naval power, that being the way, being an island, and the United States being across the Atlantic, England at least had a policy, a process, in which in the case of war, they were able to recoup a million man army. The United States did not have that. The United States was focused so much on the naval expansion and that this goes back all the way to the previous century. If we go back to 1840s or late 1840s after the Mexican-American War, the United States had reached the Pacific Ocean. And it is no secret that President Polk was highly interested in the three ports of California and Puget Sound in order to be engaged in the China trade. China had already been carved up by many of European powers that the United States' only hope was to get into Japan. 1853 comes in, Commodore Perry and his black ship, as they were known, because of the coal that he spilled from the top. They entered Japan and forced them to you know, open up the trade. This was the closest thing the United States could get to China, but it was a step. Thus, thus uh, confirming that the United States was more focused on the China trade 
and their efforts to get to the Pacific Ocean. Another thing that happened is William Henry Seward, Secretary of State, purchases Alaska and also is a big proponent of the, Inter uh, the Intercontinental Railroad. This rail was to connect both the East Coast and the West Coast with San Francisco being, as he called it, the Constantinople of the West, of the Pacific, because there would be the center of all trade, the China trade again. So this railroad system that was going to be created was going to facilitate this, this naval power from Asia coming to the United States and instead of going all the way around the Strait of Magellan down in Argentina and South America, it would just cut to the United States. So all these things were put in place for the global uh, trade network that was going to be involved, uh, the Chinese network. As time progressed, the Civil War happened in the 1860s. And thus, all these plans to uh, improve the United States' naval position around the world had to be put on, on, on hold. 